Well, thank you, Dr. Stevens. Um, we appreciate your ongoing years of support and the support of all of our sponsors. I'm now proud to talk to you a little bit about our theme for this event, the constellation, and where do you fit within it? And I wanted to start first by sharing the thought, what if, what if this was the time for maternal mental health? And I'm gonna share a video. Play that one more time. So what if now was the time for maternal mental health? I think you'll find throughout our presentations the next three days that we're really at a remarkable time in our history. I'm gonna walk you through a few options here and a few constellations that we think you might all fit in to make this all happen. So I'm gonna start with looking at nine players or what we call the nine Ps. And you may know that constellations appear and wrap around the sun, and they usually look like features or characters. And here on this screen, the sun is represented as the mother, and that we all wrap around the nine Ps or nine players wrap around the mother. So you'll see here that we have um, partners and families listed a critical um, player in a mother's life in the perinatal period. Uh, we also have providers listed, listed as hospitals and health systems, obviously really important player uh, uh, so wrapping around the mother. And I wanna go through a few of these um, in a deeper uh, way. And we're gonna start with providers. So what type of providers are we talking about here as individual providers? And you should see yourself if you're a provider on this screen. So we're talking about obstetricians, OBGYNs. Sometimes obstetricians are defined broader to include midwives and family practice providers who deliver babies. There's also doulas. And we've been hearing and learning more and more about doulas providing support to pregnant people, pregnant mothers, and also during pregnancy or even in the postpartum period. We actually have a doula networking group later today, which we'll talk about in a moment. So welcome doulas. So what about certified mental health peer support specialists or supporters? Uh, there's growing evidence that is illustrating that for maternal mental health, certified peers can play a remarkable role in augmenting treatment shortages and supporting women where they are. Nurses, of course, play a critical role in wrapping uh, around a mother during the perinatal period. Psychiatrists are MDs, typically who prescribe uh, during the perinatal period for ma uh, maternal mental health disorders, but they can do much more when they have capacity. Psychologists are critical players here as well. Psychologists uh, can do full assessments and support a mother and a really refined diagnosis and also can provide talk therapy and mental health therapists of other kinds, like 
counselors or licensed clinical social workers, for example, of course, play a critical role in the individual provider community. We didn't wanna leave out lactation consultants. They're the first often to recognize there's a problem since there's been a growing effort to support um, women and families with breastfeeding. And then we also wanted to mention that we think there should be an important role for home visitors or home health nurses. And we think that um, insurance coverage should actually help support this work and these individuals. I'm going to go back up to the next slide. Um, public agencies. So, wanted to talk a little bit about the role of this player. So, some of you are with public health departments. Um, you may be with federal agencies. We know we have quite a few folks um, from HRSA here um, today and over the next three days. Welcome to all of you. All of you know now, especially after the COVID crisis, who the CDC is, and they play a critical role in supporting maternal mental health and suicide prevention. And the um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, is also playing a critical role in supporting community-based organizations in particular and providing technical assistance. Those are federal agencies. If we look at a state level, um, we have a Health and Human Services Agency not only at a federal level, but also at a state level. Health and Human Services Agencies can play a real, really critical role uh, in, in, in effectuating change for maternal mental health as the coordinating agency for the agencies that sit below them here on this slide um, and many others, public health departments and mental health departments and even Medicaid agencies um, can be listed on this slide as well. So let's move on to another P, talk about policymakers. Um, all of you are very familiar, I think, with 2020 Moms' work and other uh, collaborator collaborators in our space, like Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance, and working with um, Congress, federal branch here, and also state legislatures. Uh, policymakers in these roles play a critical role in helping to set the frameworks for effectuating change through legislation. All right, I'm going to talk about payers next. And some would argue that payers are actually um, playing a very critical role and perhaps the most critical role in effectuating change in maternal mental health and mental health. So when we talk about payers, what do we mean? We mean private insurers. Many of you automatically think of a private insurer um, like a United Healthcare or even a Cigna um, Healthcare. Uh, we also, though, as I mentioned earlier, have state Medicaid agencies that are considered payers. They implement change with direction from CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, and also um, implement their own change in, and um, policy around maternal and mental health um, care delivery. And then employers, uh, we often don't think about as being payers, but really they are. Um, they select and purchase private insurance plans for employees here in America. And they also um, often are what we call self-insured. And so they only use the United Healthcare's of the world to pay claims as on an administrative basis. They don't make decisions, the employer does. Um, the employer holds the purse string and really makes the, the payment decisions. So it can play a really critical role. We'll get to meet someone from um, uh, the Purchaser Business Group on Health in our upcoming um, panel who can help elaborate on this point. All right, um, private partners. What do we mean by this P? So by private partners, we mean companies that are working to create new solutions, um, not just individual providers, but um, solutions like new apps or new apps or even drug therapies. So you can see here pharmaceutical companies would be considered a private partner or technology companies, again, new apps, for example. Next, I'm gonna move on to program providers. And this is a P that we haven't talked much about, but we felt like was worth listing here. Uh, we wanted to um, point out that program providers can be individual providers, like we've mentioned before, who provide um, NICU support, for example, through a program. So perhaps a six week program to deliver a model like mothers and babies. That model will be presented as a breakout session um, tomorrow during the breakout session. So NICU, neonatal intensive care unit, 
support for mothers and, and fathers as well. Um, Community-based organizations, they can also provide programmatic support and can provide uh, support groups through models like the Inspire Method developed by Kay Matthews out of the Shades of Blue Project, for example. So a program that's delivered uh, to a group of people. And then individual mental health providers, of course, can provide group-based um, um, programmatic work or even individual programs where they're working through um, a curricula, for example. These are program providers and we wanted to make sure that we called them out because they really do play a critical role. You can perhaps think of other program providers now as well. And then last, I wanted to walk through um, philanthropy and nonprofit partners. So you can imagine when we talk about philanthropy, we're talking about organizations like those that funded and sponsored this event, um, like the California Healthcare Foundation, the Zoma Foundation, for example, and national nonprofit partners. We know some of you are joining us now um, CLASS, the Center for um, Law and Policy. Um, also, um, we have Zero to Three on, for example, Postpartum Support International. So again, critical partners. So I'm gonna um, back up now and I want to just take a moment and ask you to think about out of those nine Ps, where do you sit? And you might have one or two roles that you play. So where do you sit in the constellation? And I'm gonna ask that you go into the Whova app right now. So you're watching us through the Whova app now. Um, you can use the chat feature and let us know um, where do you sit in the constellation? And we're gonna give you just a minute or two to respond. If you chose the option to join in Zoom, Whova should still be open just below your Zoom window. So please don't leave. I, I did see a couple folks leave. Please stay with us. Uh, you can double click on your Zoom window if you're in Zoom and you should see Whova right below it and you can chat us there. Thank you, Josh. Well, great. We cannot wait to go in and um, pull out uh, where all of you sit in the maternal mental health constellation. I have one more thing that I wanna share with you. We're gonna be talking about a new issue brief uh, during the next three days that was unveiled by 2020 Mom. Um, we had a great a staff that has pulled together all that you need to know about universal maternal mental health screening. And um, this brief, I'm gonna give you a few highlights, um, talk about primary screening tools. So what do we mean by primary screening tools? Well, many of you know about the Edinburgh or EDPS as it's called, um, depression screening tool. That's the most common screening tool used in the perinatal period um, by those who uh, screen patients outside of the perinatal period. The PHQ-9 is the most common um, screening tool, but we also highlight a few other primary screening tool options that we want to give you some insight on now. One is the PHQ-4, which is actually lesser known and less utilized, but we wanted to call it out as a, um, evidence-based um, screener during this period to detect both anxiety and depression. So two questions each, really helpful when um, frontline providers such as obstetricians are short on time. We also wanted to call out and point out the important issue that um, many researchers are starting to uh, promote the idea that perhaps these initial screening tools, the ET EDPS and the PHQ-9, for example, we're not looking at specific populations or including enough of the black population, for example. And so there's been um, an effort to point out the fact that perhaps it's more evidence-based and appropriate to be screening for stress because black, the black population, for example, may not relate to the questions in the Enberg or EPDS, for example, but would relate to uh, measures of stress and that this could be a helpful indicator to determine if there's potential risk for depression or anxiety. We also highlight screening tools that are considered secondary screening tools. There's been an effort at 2020 Mom um, to do what we say, do no harm. So we do think screening is important, but we've also seen that harm can be done when it's not done well. 
And this is where secondary screening tools come into play. So what do I mean by secondary screening tools? Um, there are secondary screeners that um, help detect, for example, a possible um, OCD uh, or intrusive thoughts. And why is this important? We have all heard and read even in media stories about cases where a mother has reported horrible intrusive thoughts, unwanted thoughts um, that really distress her and providers are confused and think it might be a postpartum psychosis and send her to the ER. Um, and there things don't go well either. And we'll be talking about um, opportunities to improve um, care delivery for maternal mental health in hospital settings, particularly around detecting suicide in one of our breakout sessions tomorrow. But it's really critical that we screen for OCD when um, intrusive thoughts are present or, or even when a mother screens positive for anxiety in order to do no harm and not make a mistake. We also wanna ensure that when a mother has a positive depression screening, that a bipolar disorder screening tool is utilized. That um, common um, bipolar disorder screening tool is listed in the white paper as well. And why is that important? Um, because often uh, frontline providers will offer um, prescription for an antidepressant, and that's a good option to offer and give a range of options. Um, but if a woman with a bipolar disorder is prescribed an antidepressant, it may trigger a mania, which could lead to a postpartum psychosis. So it's very important that bipolar disorder be ruled out. And then here about suicide, um, we all know that our common and primary screening tools ask a question sometimes too about, about um, suicidal thoughts. But we also know that a detecting a suicidal thought is not reason to send a woman to an ER, for example, that a treatment plan should be developed based off of suicidal risk. And there's risk assessments and that uh, helps providers look at whether someone is actually suicidal or might just have a suicidal thought, but not be at risk for suicide. And then when a woman is at risk for suicide, other tools are listed again here, including um, a, a risk assessment. Is she safe at home? Are there people at home that can support her and watch her all the time? Or does she actually need to be sent to the ER? We couldn't, um, of course, uh, not address um, barriers and opportunities to increase screening rates. And all of you have heard these barriers and opportunities many, many times before. I imagine if you're not new to the field, um, the first and most compelling opportunity that we must um, address together is treatment shortages, especially now with the COVID crisis, we have a severe uh, shortage of mental mental health providers. Mental Health America reported last year here at the forum um, that most states on average, in most states, um, only 7% of the population has access to mental health care. And that means ability to get into treatment in, in an appropriate amount of time. So that is severely um, lacking. And we imagine that mothers suffering from these disorders are also in the same boat, uh, have to hunt for support at the most inopportune time. So what are some of the opportunities to increase um, um, treatments? One is we talked about the use of state certified peer support specialists. So um, now in the US, every single state uh, has an opportunity for professionals to get certified peer, su peer support specialists to get certified as professionals in their state to provide either substance use disorder treatment or mental health treatment or both. Um, there's a model that has been tested by 2020 Mom and many of our partners that will be presented on the main stage um, uh, tomorrow, or I'm sorry, at a breakout session tomorrow. And we encourage you to, to go to that if you want to learn more about the role of state certified peer support specialists. They can do many things, including screen in a primary care setting or obstetric setting and provide care coordination. We'll hear about that from someone on our panel um, here shortly. And they can also um, provide uh, in, in immediate support through brief intervention. So we can also increase frontline provider office capacity. So um, providers like obstetricians or even pediatricians through things like providing consultation and um, case management support. Increasing insurance coverage of provider prescribed digital therapeutics. We'll hear about that today in a, one of the networking sessions 
you're wondering what digital therapeutics is about, we also hear from one of our fast pitch companies later today um, who has created a digital therapeutics for postpartum depression. Um, and other novel treatment options. So many of you know about Zolreso, um, the new drug therapy or infusion therapy. Um, and that is considered a novel treatment. And we need to ensure that those treatments are all covered when they're evidence-based and approved by the FDA. So in addition to treatment shortages, we also um, believe that the bifurcated mental health and medical care systems make screening for mental health disorders, including maternal mental health disorders, particularly complex. Um, as many of us know, we talk about sending a woman who's at risk for preeclampsia, for example, to a high-risk OB down the hall, um, and those OBs connect, for example, with a bifurcated mental health system, a separate system, separate from our medical system, both um, in pay, in, from a payment perspective um, and also provider perspective makes it very challenging. And the brief helps make the case that carving in mental health into medical care um, contracts by payers um, is really important to, for, to effectuate change. It's considered foundational. Even if we were to address all of the treatment shortages that exist, this, this bifurcated system would still make it very challenging to increase screening rates, um, and incentivize providers to feel supported in screening. And then the final bullet point here is that we believe there is an opportunity to create a mental health primary care home. Um, the panel that's going to be speaking next will perhaps touch on this concept just a bit, but who can really assess um, a woman um, in full and then know where should, she should be referred for treatment. And then reimbursement to obstetricians is critical. Um, obstetricians right now are paid, generally paid through a capitation rate. Um, so one flat rate through, through pregnancy um, um, being confirmed and the postpartum visit. Um, we believe that this is critical to change and help communicate that providers can bill outside of that capitation for screening and other treatments. Right now, most obstetricians don't believe that that's the case. And we think it's important that they understand they can bill and that insurance companies publish their billing protocol. With that, um, I, I appreciate um, presenting to all of you today. We are gonna stop the presentation and we invite you to participate in our first, what we call word cloud of the day. And you can see we've put instructions here. You're gonna to have to type this into a new browser on your screen or on your iPhone or wherever you're joining us from. It's pollev.com backslash 2020 mom. And we invite you to type in a keyword or phrase that most resonated with you for this particular session. Where do you fit in the constellation and an overview on the new screening brief? If you want to use two words, make sure you use an underscore under the word or phrase that most resonated with you. We'll give you just a minute to put that um, up into Poll Everywhere, and then we're gonna show you the results of that poll in just a moment. All right, thank you, Josh. So provider, the P's, the nine P's um, are jumping up and look, it's moving real time. So keep the words coming. Um, but I think it's really interesting. Not only do we know that our work centers around mothers, but we know that our work centers around providers feeling supported in screening and um, being wrapped around with all of the other nine um, P's in the constellation. We'll give it one more uh, minute here. Support is popping up um, even more here. Screening provider support. Um, it's interesting to see nurse really highlighted in this, in this slide. And I imagine we've got quite a few nurses here joining us today. The PHQ-4 um, stood out to at least a few of you as something that's important to consider and public agencies, excellent. 
Well, we will share these slides with all of you in Whova, so you can see again um, after each of these sessions which which um, words are really resonating with the audience. And we are now um, going to make a few announcements. So, what else do you have to look forward to today? Um, up next is going to be a break and an optional mindfulness meditation. Um, you might be thinking that that sounds strange. What is a mindfulness meditation? Um, I don't do meditations. I don't do Zen. Um, we actually encourage you to use this time to try it out for the first time. We have two coaches who are joining us um, from leading organizations. Uh, they do meditations for companies like Calm. Many of us know that company and that app. After that meditation, we'll have a short break and um, we'll hear right after after that break about um, one mother's story. We can't wait to hear Marielle's story, a Latina mom, um, and all that she suffered with her two pregnancies. Those of you who have been to a forum know that um, it's the way we start our work. We start with a mother's experience to remind us why we are all here and of the challenges and that no one story is the same. After we hear that story, um, we're going to welcome Chris Botts to the stage from the American Medical Association for our first panel, um, but not quite yet. And that will be after our break. And following that panel will be another short break. We'll come back to the main stage to hear five women led startup companies talk about their solutions in a fast pitch manner, um, their solutions to close gaps in maternal mental health care. We will close out this first day with our first networking session of the three-day event. And these sessions are um, labeled as topic or profession networking sessions. Um, they may be of interest to you by profession or even some topics, um, including how partners, uh, women and their husbands or spouses can um, do more together to prevent and mitigate stress in the postpartum period. So visit the agenda and Whova during the break to pick the session, the networking session of your choice and to connect with others like you. Um, you also should know that you can host a meetup in our platform, Whova, anytime over the next three days or even the next three months by posting a meetup just by creating it in the app in Whova for any topic that you wish, or even if you want to convene as a state, for example, or a county, if you know there's a lot of people from your county, you can host a meetup and it'll be published in Whova. So consider hosting one or looking for one to join. So more about Whova, even though you will view sessions in Zoom, you can use the chat feature in Whova um, at the right side of the viewing window to chat with other audience members or even share comments about the presentations that have been made. If you have questions for presenters, however, we encourage you to use the Q&A section um, for each session. Um, and those questions will be answered in Whova this week. They're not going to be answered real time on the main stage. And then I wanted to introduce our graphic facilitator. Mana um, Kira is with us again this year. Many of you remember uh, this is a highlight of our forums. She'll be illustrating key points from our main stage um, sessions. And she'll be pinned up when she has something wonderful to share from our presenters. Her live video, again, will be shared throughout our sessions together over the next three days. Our exhibitor passport um, uh, contest, we wanted to remind you of that, to get virtual stamps from all 17 exhibitors. And be, they'll be entered, all of you who get um, 17 stamps will be entered to win one of three prizes. Um, we have a name, the name a star prize, an actual star where you get to name it, a poetry book by a poet who will be joining us on the main stage on Friday and more. And then finally, I wanted to share that if you wish to look at documents that are featured by our speakers during the session, including the issue brief I just presented, you can go to that session, so this session, and you can find um, um, the session description, it will include a link to all of the handouts for that particular session.